Hello and welcome to this edition of Bite Size PD on January 12th, 2022. My name is Scott Christensen and I am here today with my counterpart in crime. Leslie Morris, hello. I work with middle school ELA and with the SALT program and and I work with high school and reading intervention in secondary. Today, we're going to be focusing on our second session um, for the Canyons writing series, which is going to be pre-writing. So we're looking at pre-writing strategies for successful drafts. We're going to look at three techniques. We could look at quite a few, um, but Leslie and I sat down and looked at these as probably three really easy ways to get started or or they're really powerful tools you can use. Um, one thing to consider or to think about uh, too is our monthly challenge, which we sent uh, an email about with an, in the newsletter. The monthly challenge gives you the opportunity to choose levels of participation and then provide you with a stipend. The first monthly challenge was with summarizing and this video will lead into our second monthly challenge. Vanna. As usual, we have our professional development norms, which are to be committed, be responsible, be respectful, and to be safe. Uh, these are some norms right here for when we are doing, uh, when we're online together, which is just to mute your microphone, turn your camera on if you're comfortable having it, blow your background if you like. And if you have a question or comment to type it in the chat. This is our MTSS framework. Let me get my glasses on, see if I can read any of that. Oh, she moved me on. It's okay. okay. And these are our learning intentions and success criteria. Today's learning intention is that we understand the importance of planning and that we learn some techniques. And success, the success criteria then is that we use one of these planning strategies with our students. Uh, Leslie and I feel it's really important to always have a rationale as well. So this one comes from Abraham Lincoln. And, and uh, the, the quote is, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening, sharpening the ax. I don't know why he said sharpening twice. That must be a typo. Maybe for emphasis. Yes, that's and, it. Exactly. And so that provides the, the rationale for planning. Give me six hours to write. Actually, give me an on-demand write for one hour, and I'm going to spend some time, probably not two-thirds of it, but I'm going to spend a good little chunk of time planning. So why plan? We just kind of went into that a little bit, but this is our agenda where we'll talk about why plan. Then we're going to talk about three strategies. One, narrow, narrowing the topic. Two, using discussion to support brainstorming. And then three, we're going to look at ABC planning for on-demand type writing prompts. And then we'll sum it all up. Looks good. Okay. So this quote comes um, from The Writing Revolution, if you've read it with Wexler. It says, we found that teaching students to plan can actually enhance their creativity. If students are working from a plan, they're liberated from the need to figure out the overall structure of what they're writing as they go along. As a result, they have the mental space they need to conjure up vivid imagery or telling details. So I know that when I was teaching, it was always tempting to move straight from the topic into the writing, but I noticed that my students' writing wasn't as good when they did that. And so building in the time to write and teaching students strategies for writing actually helps them be more creative. And we know that whether it's nonfiction writing or fiction writing, like creativity plays a huge part in making it interesting. And that's what I want all of my students writing to be like. So super important to plan. Now I'm going to talk about narrowing down a topic and I'm gonna use or discuss two different strategies. So this first one, is called brain racing. And this is a quick overview of what it's like, but Scott is actually going to act as students in my classroom. And I'm going to share my iPad screen and pretend I'm writing on the whiteboard. 
So a couple of things I love about this strategy is it can be really informal. It's something you can do as a class. Students can do it in groups, pairs, or individually, and you don't have to pre-prep anything. They just need white space to write on. So the other thing I want to say before we start is, um, well, I'm pulling, so I have to talk about this book, Writing Down the Bones. I don't know if you can see it in my screen, but it. it's a creative writing book that I got in college and Scott actually got it in his master's program as well. And even though it's creative writing, I think it really applies to all types of writing. She has a chapter in here called First Thoughts where she says that your first thoughts have tremendous energy, but your internal sensor usually squelches them. And so we live in the realm of second and third thoughts, things thought about twice, three times removed from the di direct connection of the first flash. And so when you have these first thoughts that are censored, usually that's what we end up writing about because it's safe. And so the way you get through that is to not stop writing. So I know a lot of teachers do quick writes um, or five minute writing sessions or, you know, timed writing at the very beginning of class. This is the same idea, but we're going to use it with a more formal essay. And another chapter in this book talks about uh, how the blank page can be intimidating is what she says. And so you need to keep a list of topics within your writing process. So brain racing actually helps answer both of those concerns. So let me share my screen here. And I do not know the topic, so this is going to come at me cold. This is going to make me just like a student. Okay. I created a little good notes. We're going to pretend this is the whiteboard. Okay, Scott, thanks for being our student today. So here's your topic. We are okay. starting an entire unit, and we're going to be talking about heroes. Okay. So let's brainstorm what makes a hero okay 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 i'm gonna write uh, for you okay um sacrifice circumstance talk to me more about circumstance any circumstance can make a hero i think you have to be in a certain situation in order to be to have the um option of becoming a hero it's almost like a general what is it a five-star general has to ha have a war in order to get the fifth star so i think without the situation you where you have the option to become a hero or opportunity to become a hero you you can't really become a hero okay what else um, what else makes a hero uh i said sacrifice i think um empathy What else? Uh, focus on the greater good. Long-term vision. You guys get to see all of my excellent handwriting skills. I was not elementary teacher. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Uh, greater than. Talk to me more about that. In, in that situation, the hero is going to be greater than um, the average person. Okay. And how are they greater? They do what's needed to get done. That's right. Although now I'm sitting here looking at hero as though it's only right. And I guess you could say, if we look back and past that some heroes have been wrong. And do but you they remember rise what those type of heroes are called? Anti-heroes. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly it. Okay, I'm going to stop here, but yeah. I hope you guys noticed that I kept saying, what else? Tell me more about that. So the idea is that students brainstorm and they get a list of 10 things before they even make a decision on a topic. Then you take, oh, let's do purple. 
Then you're going to take one more, one of these and go deeper. So Scott, which one of these characteristics do you want to go deeper on about heroes? I kind of like the, the idea of circumstance. Okay. So we're going to, I call it a detailed topic. So talk to me if we're thinking of what makes a hero and you say their circumstance makes their, them a hero. Explain that more. Give me more okay. details about that. Uh, hardship. There has to be hardship. Uh, there has to be a problem. Mm. The problem has to be if that affects a majority. Okay. Or at least affects some a group a group of people who might not necessarily be able to defend themselves against it. Okay. Right. I can't be a hero if I like had a, had a rough morning and went through Starbucks and got a cup of coffee. And now I come in with a smile on my face or something like this doesn't affect anyone else. Right. It has to right. others and but when they I was, can't defend, defend themselves. Right. But when I was in traffic this morning running late for work and I couldn't merge and the one guy slowed down and let me in, that guy was a hero. Yes, because <laughs> then you didn't have to slam on your brakes and cause a pileup on the freeway or sl massive slowdown like happens all the time, right? Yep. Okay, what else? So we have hardship, problem. Um, I think they have to have ability and training. Ooh, let's make that two different things. Okay. Right? Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like Hercules – he was naturally strong. Right. But he still had a mentor that trained him in other ways. Right. What else? Um, I, I think a hero also, since you bring up Hercules, has to have multiple exceptionalities. So not just strong, but also mental uh, ability to know when to use the strength. Yeah. Okay, let's and also, go if we're, if we're going with that, not just say streets or not just book smart, but street smart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They have so, to be relatable too. We have to be able to relate to them. Oh, I'm typing the wrong thing. Okay, so we're going to stop here, but you would have the students brainstorm 10 things, right? And then in pairs, they're going to talk to each other the way Scott and I have been talking to each other. Tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? I don't understand. But don't you think, right, like I might question Scott and say, do they really need to be book smart? Because Hercules was pretty dumb. Um, <laughs> and then they can kind of work through and talk through those ideas. And then at the very end, they're going to choose what they want to do for their essay. So remember, our topic is what makes a hero? And our more narrow topic is circumstance. And Scott, if you were writing this essay, what were what would be three of these things that you would want to talk about? Uh, I think I would want to talk about um that there has to be a problem that affects a group of people that the hero has to be relatable and that the hero has to have an ability that matches whatever that circumstance is what they need mm -hmm. so this is a classic three paragraph essay structure and not every essay needs to be a three paragraph structure but with this students now have a lot of different ideas which is a lot more interesting than saying, what makes a hero? Paragraph one, they have to sacrifice. Paragraph two, they have to have empathy. Paragraph three, they have to have long-term vision. Now you can say one thing that makes a hero is their circumstance and go into the problem, how their ability matches the problem, and how being relatable actually helps them benefit people. Right? So... This is the first strategy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to leave and go write this now. <laughs>
go. I want it. I want a rough draft tomorrow before eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> So the other strategy is actually embedded in this, but you can, you can use this whenever. So I don't have, it's not specific, but it's use academic discussion as a bridge to writing. We need, um, so Laura Rowe brought, wrote in read, talk, write. She said, we want our students to explore ideas in a situation where peers can support them as they test out the validity of their ideas. And then she uses this analogy, which I love. This is like trying on five pairs of jeans until you find the right pair. No one criticizes the jeans that don't fit. You are in charge of deciding what to purchase, which to purchase. So I love that because we know that so many of our students come in with writing scars. They're terrified, right? They're terrified to write something because they've been told in the past, that they were wrong or it wasn't good. And so by having discussion before writing, students get to try out that idea. It's a, it's a rough, rough draft. And it also helps them gather ideas from each other, talk it out, think it out. So this is something that you can embed in any pre-writing strategy. Let's say you're having students do a pro-con chart. Great. Then have them do a quick turn and talk and share three of their pros, three of their cons, and then have the other person choose one to question. And so they have to kind of defend their reason for why they chose something. Or uh, I used to do uh, concept maps all the time. And so students can share that. And then their partner asks questions. So it's really important, this aspect of exploring the idea and testing their validity. It's not just, here's my list, or here's my idea. It's the questions that really help students form their thoughts before they write. To put it on like a professional level, how many of you have talked to a colleague or read an email to a colleague before sending it? Because you needed to talk about it before you sent the email to make sure that it conveyed what you wanted to convey. So those are the first two more general writing strategies. All right. Um, and then the third writing strategy takes elements of, of those and uh, brings it all together into a, a little bit more of a formal process. And so this comes from Kelly Gallagher, uh, one of his books. He's a, I'm a big fan of his. If you ever get a chance to see him speak, uh, he's awesome. So. He says, uh, writing on demand has become a gatekeeping issue. Students taught to write well have the key to unlock gates to better opportunities. Students who do not write well on demand risk being locked out. And so as much as we, you know, necessarily, especially those of us who, you know, we write and we teach writing, we don't necessarily love the, the timed types of writing. I think it's in our best interest to prepare our students for that uh, so that they can, you know, have those opportunities later on. So this is something I used to use in the classroom. I'd used it with eighth grade and 10th grade, and it's the ABC plan. The, the idea is that you attack the prompt, uh, you brainstorm answers, and you choose the order of your response. So I'll go ahead now, and I'm going to put it on my iPad, and, um, and then we'll go ahead and go from there. All right, so ABC planning works uh, like this. The first thing you want to do is you want to be able to attack the prompt. And in attacking the prompt, there are three or four things you can do. But really, what we're trying to do is get away from the all of this jargon that's sitting in here and really narrow this down into what exactly is this asking me to do. This is something that traditionally, when I did with my students, we would spend a good couple weeks of just narrowing this down and getting this hammered out and, and, and mastering it until they could attack a prompt and do what we're about to do in about a minute. Uh, you know, this, this sort of helped them narrow in 
they're thinking and it's a lot like the brain race afterwards um but here's a joke one it's uh here's a prompt i use with my students they used to love this one uh but fanny packs have taken uh have come back into fashion so this would be one to do now to see the other side of it but to help students better uh, be prepared to learn the school is now requiring that every student wears a belt pack also known as a fanny pack but they're not letting you call it that at all times while in school the school is providing the belt pack which has extra writing utensils a small first aid kit erasers and other school supplies pick a side and make a case for or against belt packs if you really want to challenge you should probably argue for the belt packs so that's a lot right there and i think what happens is when we show these giant pieces to students they can easily become confused usually what we'll have is exposition and then we'll have the task and so what we want to do is attack the prop and tear it apart so that we can break it into its pieces and help us to focus in on what it is we want to write so with that, the first thing I want to do is circle all of the words that ask me to do something. I'm looking down at my iPad here while, while I'm going through this, but to help students be better prepared to learn isn't asking me to do anything so I can get rid of all of this in my head. Um, this is all just exposition. The school's providing a belt pack. This is all exposition. All the way down to here, and now I start to have my writing prompt. So the first thing I'm gonna do is circle words that ask me to do something. This, let me make this a little bit bigger. This is asking me to pick a side. Ooh, that's too big. <laughs> Yikes. I chose the, the fourth, the first one on that row that you were in. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. This is asking me to pick a side. So I'm picking a side and then it's also asking me to make a case. Those are, those are my verbs. Now, I. Uh, I then want to draw an arrow to what it's asking me to do. So I'm picking a side either for or against packs, belt packs, fanny packs, and then I'm also making a case for or against fanny packs. So now what I do is I go down, and this is a more simple one. I have some more examples that I can show you where it's a little bit you know, uh, more formal like the ones we do, but I'm just going to say, okay, I want to, first thing I want to do is pick a side. And then I want to make a case. Now, normally we would see now write to using evidence to da, 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 and, I, and I might put that in there. Since both of these move towards the same thing, then I'm going to say uh, basically belt packs. And there you go. So I've attacked the prompt. I've looked at a pick a side, make a case for or against belt packs. Let me move to one that's just a little bit more uh one i've actually used with students that i mean i guess i use the other one but one that is a little bit more formal so this one was we had just done a unit on edgar Allan poe and we'd read a bunch of his stuff this was a, one of my eighth grade classes and we were really talking about um you know the um literary devices and that he was using and and this idea of mood and the effect that it creates on the reader and so and this, this kind of sets it up as in, in a way that you would probably see these kinds of writing prompts more often, where the beginning is exposition. So Edgar Allan Poe is a master critting a distinguishing mood in his stories and poems. And the Raven and such stories as the Cask of Mont Amontillado, Mask of the Red Death, Pit and Pendulum, and Telltale Heart, Poe creates a very distinctive and effective atmosphere. So I know this is just exposition. It's not telling me what to do yet. Select one of Edgar Allan Poe's short stories or poems and write an essay that analyzes how the author was able to create a particular mood in his stories and what effect it has on the reader. Remember to include various literary techniques Poe used, such as setting, foreshadowing, imagery, symbolism, and suspense. So now I can go into this and I can say, okay, that's a lot of stuff. If I'm a kid who's not used to, or anybody who's not used to uh, on-demand writing, I'm overwhelmed, so I can break this down. I'm going to go through and I'm just going to circle everything that asked me to do something first. So I'm selecting, I'm writing. writing. Yep. What Would you circle analyze? Write yep. that analyzes? Uh, Even though it's not a verb in this sentence? No, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't circle that. Okay. Nope. I would circle the remember. Okay. That's my hint to my to my kids. Now we don't see that all the time, but what am I selecting? 
You're going to select one short story or poem. Okay, one short story or one poem. And what am I writing? You're going to write an essay. Yep, an essay. And that's where I might, that's where this might all come into play. Yeah, because your long. essay should analyze uh, the mood mm -hmm. and the effect on the reader. But yep. yeah, there's a lot of extra words there. Mood and effect on reader. So I can then go into this and go, I'm writing an essay. I can drop a lot of this, crossing it out. Now, what am I remembering? Um, you need to include literary techniques. So okay. setting, foreshadowing, imagery, symbolism, and suspense. Okay. So now what I do as a student is I, I go through this. And, and again, this is something you want to model and do with your students over and over and over again. I think Wesley asked a great question. The students are going to ask you, um, you know, is this one of the verbs? But the first thing I'm just going to say, okay, select. And then I'm going to say write. And then I'm going to say remember. Those are my things I need to do. And now I'm going to shorthand it all, but I'm just going to say I'm going to select a, you know, one poem or short story. Uh, I'm writing an essay that analyzes mood and effect on reader. And then I'm remembering literary techniques. Okay, so by doing that now, I've really honed in on exactly what this prompt is asking me to do. And it's very clear to me. Um, the idea is that you basically have a map before you start writing. I don't know how many times I've seen uh, students, you know, you give them a prompt like this and they start to write. And then as they start writing, uh, I always think of the analogy of painting yourself into a corner. They write themselves into a corner and then they look up and they're kind of confused. They don't know where to go next. What do I do? I'm, I'm on paragraph three and I don't know what to do, or I'm paragraph two and I don't know what to do. So this really hones, starts to help to hone it in. So that's the first part of attacking the, the prompt. Now that I know exactly what this is asking me to do, now I can go in and I can start to do the B, which is to brainstorm. Now, I don't like to put kids in boxes. Everyone's got their diff different way of doing things. I like to brainstorm using web maps. So I'll use that with my students, but then I'll also use um, the Roman numeral way to brainstorm. And I'll just also use sort of a word, uh, a word wall, you know, a, a Jackson Pollock word vomit on a page, whatever needs to happen. So there's two layers to this. One, we're looking at the poem. And then two, we're looking at the essay. Um, and then we're also looking at literary technique. So there's actually three layers to this. So I'm a student right now. I'm doing this. Or do you want to be my student, Leslie? I can be your student. All right, cool. So you're picking one. one the of these telltale that... heart. Okay. So again, I'm just going to abbreviate PTH. Okay. So I'm putting that right in the middle. And again, I want my kids to do this. Uh, my students always did this before they wrote anything. Uh, this could be... Uh, best suited for informative or argumentative, but telltale heart. Okay, we got it. We picked it. You might have two or three. And as you go through, you'd have to knock it down, but you know exactly where you want to go. And most, a lot of people will know that. Okay. Now we're talking about uh, analyzing mood and effect for the telltale heart. Okay. So I think the mood is I, I don't know how to word this right, but like almost like anxious. Okay. Like, but I can't decide if that's really how I feel as a reader, because as a reader, I'm like wondering if he's going to get caught, if the police officer is going to find the body. I don't know. And it's just like ramping up and up the whole time. Okay. And what is, what do we call that? <clears throat> well, I don't where, know. Where the pressure is amping up for our reader. It's where, where escalating. It's it's a, it is escalating, but if that there was a literary technique, what would we call that? Oh man, I it's don't... we're build we're building something here. You're building suspense. Exactly right. So we have suspense. Nice. Okay. What and else so what I really just described is the effect on the reader is that anxious feeling. 
Mm -hmm. And he creates that, oh geez, he creates that effect by creating, by using suspense, right? Right. But let's, go, let's go a little bit further if we're going to analyze that now. If I'm writing a liter, if I'm writing a piece about the telltale heart and how he um, is using suspense to create the mood, then I want to pick some scenarios where I can show this, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some scenarios where I can show this? So I think it, one technique is the sound of the heart, right? The, and I can't remember exactly if it says thump, 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 but it repeats and yep. it gets more frequent. Okay. What I else? think it, how he keeps looking over at the floorboards. So to yep. me, that's real imagery because if I'm remembering right, he imagines the body underneath there. Yep. And he, and he hears it, which we already have. So now he's imagining it. What else is creating suspense? And I'm going to lead you on this one because it's okay. Please do because I because I would have led my students on this. Um, the what is it about this narrator that drives us all crazy? How do you, can we trust him? Well, no, he killed his neighbor. <laughs> but can we trust? Can we trust the story he's telling us? No, because he can't actually hear the heart beating. Right, like it's all in his head. So I can't so, decide if he's gone crazy. If it's really there. If what he's telling you is true or not. Right. So this would be our unreliable narrator. It's not reliable. So it disorients us as, as a, as a reader. Right. Right. Okay. So we could go on on this, but we probably want to knock this down to, you know, uh, four or five minutes and, and keep diving in and in further. I think we kind of went from tell, it's almost like what we just did with the brain race. But we went from telltale heart to suspense in the telltale heart to really diving into three scenarios that we would then analyze. So then the last part of this would be to choose an order. And so one of the things that we do is, you know, in building our writing piece is we want to go ahead and look at this and go, okay, um, what's the best order of events here so that each, each uh, paragraph can be distinct? I'm not a huge fan of everything having to be five. This might just be a four paragraph, I'd say. That's fine. Um, but what do you think, Leslie, of the order? Well, I can see doing, well, talking about the suspense first and yes. how he creates that with the sound and the body because in that same paragraph or right after that paragraph, you can talk about the impact that that has on the reader Okay. Um, and then the unreliable narrator is a different technique, right? Because the sound and the imagery, they, they're connected, but the narrator yep. is different. And then you can talk about how once the reader realizes that about the narrator, now they're begin beginning to question the whole story and how that relates or makes them feel anxious. Okay. So now we've got a really solid... Um, if we look at this, you're going to be writing a piece that's going to look at suspense and the unreliable narrator. And then you have the pieces, the evidence underneath each of those um, and the examples to show how those are created. Plus, you figured out how both are going to be tied to the effect on the reader. And you're going to have a really strong four paragraph essay versus doing a five that might be weak. Right. Now, right. again, we didn't have a lot of time um, right now, just a couple of minutes. But what I would do normally is I would do this with my students um actually I, I did it just for the first quarter we would do this and i know we're not there in the year so it'd be a good couple of weeks of just doing this with them um presenting it as a warm-up for the class uh using this as a formative assessment uh you know throwing a prompt up having the kids start to make their own prompts and then we all do it to each other you know we all make different prompts and we pass it around and see what what happens um so that's the first thing uh that i would do with my students. And then after I felt like they got this part of the ABC plan down, then what I would do is I would go ahead and start giving them prompts to write to. And I would teach them the D part of the ABC plan, which is um, basically going in and detecting errors, uh, revising, 
uh, not, not necessarily revision as much as going in and, and fixing grammatical problems and things like that. And that is an ABC plan. Do you have any questions? That's really cool. Yeah, it's definitely a it's it's definitely something that sounds like a lot right now, um, but when it becomes second nature, which it usually became around this time of the year for my students, we had done it so much um, that it, it it was just a really nice scaffold for them, and it was a good way to think. And I've had students who've graduated, and they said when they went to college, they were still doing the ABC plan. So when you hear that back from your students, you know it's something that worked. Right, that's exciting. All right. Okay, I'm going to kick you off. Okay. Okay. So to sum it all up, um, we want you to build in time if you if you aren't on already to have students pre-writing and planning before they enter a writing assignment. And if you are already doing this, try out one of these two strategies, practice it with your students, let us know how it goes. Um, you can reach out to me or Scott anytime. And don't forget the monthly challenge. It's a great way to take what you're already doing and embed it in your classroom, get some great feedback and get paid for it. Thanks for being here today. Bye. Thanks for, thanks for your time.